because as far as I'm concerned, this night is for you. You're here to hear something, to learn something, to get your mind flowing. I want to facilitate that. That's really what I'm here for. So, uh, so please, don't be shy. Uh, no spitballs, please. And, uh, you know, other than that, uh, you know, just uh, raise hands, yell out. Anything short, hey, fat boy works for me. So, how many people know what Zen is? Show of hands. Sure. Few people. How many people know what a hypervisor is? Show of hands. A few more people. How many people know why they're here tonight? Show of hands. <laughs> okay. We're going down the wrong path, but we'll get there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> first question, who's the fat geek up front? I've been around for a while, as uh, the, the short, uh, short description of this. I started using Linux in 1995. Um, actually, I was, uh, I was a Linux advocate before I ever saw the software, uh, which was kind of a strange thing, because I was with a team of people who were supposed to be working. How many people remember Digital Equipment Corporation? First? Sure. Yeah, sure. OK. Why not? I, I was a BMS geek. I, I had done some Unix, but I was a BMS key. And I was working on, some, on an offering that they said, well, we want, we want people to be able to transfer from VMS to Unix. And so they sent a bunch of us VMS geeks to this course to, to do this by a company called Sector 7. And you know, I said, man, you know, I haven't touched Unix in years. I, and at, when I got to the course, everyone had the same problem. You know, we had all been working with VMS for a while. And then I saw, I happened to have a little catalog with me, and I took it on the plane, and it had this thing called Linux in it. So I ended up passing the catalog throughout the, uh, throughout the course, and probably half the people in the course ordered Linux sight unseen, you know, before we were done with the course, because we just wanted to brush up on our Unix skills. And uh, uh, that, that was a big turning point for me professionally and personally. And uh, so I've been annoying people ever since about Linux. Um, I used to do a column for InfoWorld for processor on, uh, on stuff. How many people remember the Linux show? Anyone old enough to remember the Linux show? Oh, God. I do feel old tonight. It was a great, great show for interviewing various people around the open source world. I wrote a book that, you know, uh, sold all it was going to sell in three days after Slashdot talked about it in 2001. Um, but uh, I've, I've been running my mouth for a long period of time. And I am employed by Citrix, but the really cool thing is that I have no product goals at all. I like it when Citrix makes money because maybe they'll still send me a paycheck every now and again. But I am here to work with the Zen project, just the project. That's where all my goals are, quarter after quarter. And that's why I'm out at a place like this which frankly I know very little about, but I know you want to hear something, so I'm here to talk to you. That's the best meetup group in Bay Area. Most popular, yeah. <laughs> there you go, yeah. there's, there's the see? endorsement right there. Yeah, you're in the right place. And once upon a time, how many people, anyone remember Cassatt Corporation used to be headquartered in San Jose? I was working with them for a while, which was cloud before there was a cloud, really, because it was, it was actually really, uh, really cool stuff. Um, so this talk, I'm, I'm just going to start with some of the basics of what's going on with the Zen hypervisor. What is it? How does it work? Why is it suitable for a cloud? That's actually a kind of an interesting question in and of itself. There are parts of Zen. How many people remember the time of the Zen kernel? Anyone remember that? Yeah. Those times are gone. Thank you, Lord. Um, you know, you used to have to do all sorts of gyrations to get Zen to work. That is no longer the case. Uh, most major distributions, with the major exception of Red Hat, uh, it'll work out of the box. Red Hat made a business decision to throw their weight behind KVM, so you have to do different things there. But, uh, you know, Zen has come a long way. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a time when people, you know, two, three years ago, my boss, Lars Kurt, who was the community manager uh, for the Zen project, 
would go around to different show, different uh, conferences and stuff, and people would say, "Isn't Zen dead? Uh, or isn't it closed source? Citrix bought it. It's now closed source, right?" And it was an image problem because the project was alive. It's just no one knew about it. The project itself became disconnected. And I have an entirely different talk on that. <coughs> but uh, but we learned, and uh, as a result, you know, we're out talking about what we're doing, as well as doing good new stuff. And you'll learn a little bit about that today. Uh, there's also a thing called Zen Server. And inevitably, when I start talking about Zen, when someone says, yeah, I use Zen, I use Zen, uh, we get 10 minutes into the conversation, and then I realize they're talking about Zen Server. Zen Server was a Citrix product, still is a Citrix product, that uses Zen, but it's got other stuff on top of it. And so, uh, so it was real easy once upon a time to say, well, there's Zen the project and Zen server the product. But now Zen server is also a project. <laughs> it's now been open sourced entirely. So now you have two different projects. But I'm only interested really in Zen project itself. Um, and that's what we're going to at least start talking about tonight. Uh, before we get into the, the business of Zen itself, how many people here work with cloud? One way yeah. Or How many people were a cloud advocate in whatever organization you were in? You were one of the first people saying, you know what, we should be doing stuff in the cloud. Anyone there? A couple of people. How many people want to go through that again? Markedly less. <laughs> because there was a cloud problem that in fact many people didn't, didn't realize was a problem. And in fact, I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy to see so many younger people here. And I, let me just say something really quick. When I talk frequently, I, I will use some stories. And it's not because I'm trying to reminisce about the good old days or the bad old days or whatever days. It's because you can learn some interesting stuff. And when you're young, particularly, and you're working on the next great thing, you know, you've got the thing that's going to change the world. Frequently, you'll go in and you'll start talking to people who are going to use that thing, and they become horrified. And you can't figure out why. Why are they horrified? I'm, I'm doing something great. Why can't they understand it? And one of the things that we're going to see here, particularly with cloud and with a lot of other things, it's because when you change the way IT thinks, they're used to that being bad evil even. You have to understand the mindset of where we came from to get them over the hump to where you want them to go to. And if you don't understand, if you don't understand the stories of the history of where we've been in this industry, you're not going to be able to make the leap. Because sometimes logic fails. Because sometimes there's something going on more visceral and you have to be aware of that. So we're, let's talk about that for just what did IT look like pre-cloud? Stability was the game. Yeah. You know, that was the thing. You didn't want change. Change was bad. The idea was what was up stayed up, period. You didn't want flexibility. You wanted things that just happened, happened. When you left at night, and came in the following morning, what you wanted to hear is nothing happened. That was a successful evening. Because if something happened, then someone's getting a phone call at 3 a.m. saying, come in quick, the HR server's down, you don't have a job if it's not up by 8 a.m. That was excitement. That was bad. So you see, there was a very real reason to do this. So stability was everything. Ordering servers, especially, you know, younger folks, think about this. Your servers had to be planned at least a year in advance. Can you imagine that now? It had to be done at least a year in advance. You had the budget for each one of them. You know, this is pre-virtualization. You had the budget for each one of them. You had to get them shipped in. You had to get them checked out. You had to get them lined up. You had to get them loaded up. You had to get them tested. You had to get run books. It was tedium beyond words. But you had to anticipate at least a year in advance, sometimes two years in advance, depending on the, uh, on the situation. So as a result, 
there was a sense in IT that change is bad. When change arrived, you had to beat the change out of it until it became part of the status quo. And that's what you did. You beat the tar out of it until you knew every single piece of it and you knew exactly what was going to go on. That was the IT game. Now what happened with the cloud? Suddenly, it's about availability. It's about flexibility. It's about meeting the need of the business. And that's entirely different. You had to move with the economic demand. You had to move with what was going on in the industry. And suddenly, change is not bad. It's now good. And so the folks who were cloud advocates would go in and say, we're going to change everything. And people looked at them as if you had walked up to your elderly grandmother and said, you know, who goes to church three times a day, and said, I'm becoming a Satanist. I'm going to slaughter puppies with my feet every day of my life. Isn't it great? They were horrified because the visceral sense of IT was that change was evil. It must be stomped out. And now you're coming along and saying, change is good. It's the way of the future. If you don't have change, you're not succeeding. So you see that there's a, there is a problem here, a major disconnect. And frequently, you know, I, uh, when I was with Cassatt and we used to do uh, cloud infrastructure, I used to talk about the three sales that we had to do. The first sale was the one that the salesman went in. He went in, talked to the C-level person, the CIO, whomever, and he'd get the buy-in saying, this is what you need to do, because this is the benefit to you. And they'd say, okay, let's do it. Then what happens? They send in the services guy, which happened to be me most of the time, and they said, Make it work. Well, the first thing I had to do was go into the mid-level manager and explain to them why they needed to do this. Now, what did they hear? What they heard was, my kingdom is falling apart. Because what was mid-level IT measured by? It was measured by the number of boxes that you controlled and the number of people under your command. In the cloud, Everyone's sharing boxes. You don't know what's out there. You don't know whose box is which. You don't care. And it's like, oh my God, you've taken away my power base. I have nothing. What are you doing? So they wanted nothing to do with it. So you have to resell again the notion that what you're now doing is to be the enabler of the enterprise. Up until now, everything you've been doing has been cost in the eyes of the enterprise. Now you're the great facilitator. Now you're the one that makes things happen that never happened before. And then you had to sell one level below that. Once you got the, the mid-level manager, then you've got these, the sysadmins. And when you told them what they're going to do, they said, great, we're going to lose our jobs. I'm not going to help you do anything. I'm going to lose my job. It's going to be automated, and I'm out the door. And you had to do a different sell there, because what you're trying to say is, hey, you spent a lot of money and a lot of time to go to school to do this, right? Did you go to school so you could get a three o'clock in the morning phone call? Did you go to school so you could be running around with discs and tapes everything, every time something tanks in the middle of the night? No. You went because you wanted to do something interesting. Cloud allows you to take away the drudge work. It'll handle the, the crappy stuff that you never wanted to do anyway and it'll allow you time to do something more innovative. Yeah, actually, I would like to ask my first question. It's a, it's a, I, I fully agree with the, what, what, what the Russo says. You know, availability is of uh, paramount, uh, paramount importance. But I would like to say, you know, not only availability, scalability and security are equally, equally important. And I think, you know, right now, I mean, people moving to cloud, there are various kind of reasons. But uh, I mean, the primary reason probably are cost and performance. And uh, right now, the biggest challenge is probably automation. I actually would like to know how Citrix working on auto scaling in actual full, full you know, uh, it's called, uh, I mean, make make cloud free elastic. Free elastic, I mean, auto scaling. 
What are skills? Oh, what are skills? Your cluster, yes. Okay. Uh, so what, what you have there, and we'll talk about this just a little bit later, but Zen works at the hypervisor level, and it provides tools so that an orchestrator can then come in and deal with the scaling aspects. And uh, Zen has been working very well, of course, with OpenStack, CloudStack. Uh, there's also a thing called Zen Orchestra, which is out there, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit more basic, but uh, but actually uh, pretty cool for what it does. Um, so you know, part of part of what being an open source project is is that we're not trying to dictate to anybody what you need to do. We're trying to give you the power to do what you want to do. And uh, so if you just give me a, a little bit, we'll, we'll run into that just a little bit. Now this, here, here's my great graphical expertise showing, not just uh, kind of basic layers in the cloud. And as we just mentioned, you know, there's a cloud orchestration layer. There's the virtualization layer, operating systems and apps. You know, um, if you want to see good pictures, look at my boss's website. He's got tons of them. Very graphically minded. Yes, sir. Is the file orchestration a bare metal? Cloud orchestration is what controls <coughs> the elements that you see above. Yeah, or is it between bare metal? Bare metal is all. Cloud, cloud orchestration could be done in bare metal, it could be done in virtualization. There are a lot of people who think that you must control virtualization to do a cloud. Cassat, where I worked before, we used to do both. We used to do both a bare metal orchestration and a virtualization <coughs> orchestration, and we used to do them together. Uh, so there is no rule. It depends on, on what the orchestration layer is prepared to do. I will tell you from experience that orchestrating a cloud at the bare metal level uh, gets complicated, um, particularly when you have to be aware of uh, uh, various things like uh, different power controllers and everything like this when you want things to go up and down. Uh, there's lots of different languages, basically, that the system has to know, and lots of interfaces it has to master. Uh, so it's possible, but I don't see many people doing that. Well, by the operating system layer, I'm talking about something like you know Linux or Windows or what have you, and that's going to stand as part of the the app. Um, you know that, that's that's the, that's what's keeping the app alive. But from an actual virtualization standpoint or a cloud standpoint, the orchestration layer is sort of the operating system of the cloud, as it were. But the individual applications are still running in whatever environment they're designed to run in. So it could be Windows, it could be Linux, it could be free, free, free BSD, it could be uh, a mini OS, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Yeah, but then there, there, there will be no, no clear demarcation between uh, and um, Well, actually, we'll, we'll get to some differences between the two. Because the, because the different hypervisors have different designs. And we'll talk about the Zen design here in a little bit. And as a result, there are different workloads that tend to work optimally with one as opposed to another. Um, uh, how many people use VirtualBox? Okay. You know, very useful for the one-off virtualization where you want a, a desktop system. You know, uh, uh, you know, it's normally kind of a a, a POX software, P-O-C-S, technical term for piece of crap software. Uh, that uh, you know, maybe your employer told you you have to run this thing and it has certain things in there that have to be run on that operating system, but you wouldn't be caught dead with it on your desktop. So you crank up VirtualBox, you throw it in a virtual machine, and you run that thing over there, and when you're done, you shut it down or whatever, throw it to background, whatever. I mean, that's, that's good virtualization too, but it's an entirely different use case. So the question with different hypervisors is, what's your use case? What is it that you want to achieve? And when you get to the question of what you want to achieve, then you can make smart selections for well, what fits best. And we're going to talk a little bit about the, the Zen part of that. Uh, you know, I'll let the KVM expert address some of the uh, benefits of KVM, but I'm going to try to give you some of the Zen parts. But virtualization in general in the cloud scheme has certain points. Now, this is not a, you know, exhaustive list, but it's 
some basic things. It's got to be stable. If your virtualization layer isn't stable, you're, you're sunk in a cloud. Uh, it's got to be secure. And I've got an entire talk on uh, Zen security as well. But it's got to be configurable. It's got to work at large scale. Um, the user at machine paradigm. How many people have seen this? I've got a, I've got a, uh, a gas station uh, half mile from my home. And on top of each of the gas pumps, there's a, a monitor. And that monitor is supposed to be playing advertisements. You know? And inevitably, you drive up to get gas, and you see this box sitting in the middle of it. Uh, C drive, disk space low, click to continue. It's the wrong paradigm for what they're doing. Because there's no one sitting at a keyboard there waiting to click, or has a mouse there waiting to click. We get, we've been shoehorning things that don't fit. So when you're going to do a large virtualization, you don't want a model of a thousand admins standing, sitting there clicking on things. You want something that can be controlled. You know, if it requires a mouse to do it, you're in trouble when it comes to a large farm of machines. So your virtualization layer has to be able to, to deal with this. It has to take orchestration, like we just mentioned, because you don't want your hypervisor telling you what orchestrator you're going to use. It most, must be multi-tenant. Now that's not a big deal if it's, you know, if you're just a company doing your own thing. But if you're a hosting company, Multi-tenancy is huge, and we'll get into that in a minute. And you don't want to get locked in. You know, so much in the open source world, there's so much enthusiasm about finding no vendor lock-in. Well, what we're finding is that there are certain technologies that even if the, the code isn't locking you in, it's trying to lock you into a mindset where you use what the provider is there to give you. We need to break that down too. And that's part of what the, the Zen project is trying to do, is it's trying to play in as many fields as it makes sense. Now Zen's got a solid track record. We just celebrated our 10th birthday this year. It's been 10 years since the code was originally open source. Amazon, how many Amazon users here? Congratulations, you're all Zen users. Amazon runs Zen. Uh, Rackspace Public Cloud, Zen. Verizon just announced a big thing where they're going to try to take on Amazon. What's it using? Zen. It's, it's here and it's strong. And it's continuing to build. It is now a Linux Foundation collaborative project. That happened in April. We're very proud of that. Because, you know, so many people thought that it was no longer open, et cetera. Well, baloney. Part of Linux Foundation. It's it's open. It stays open. Thank you, Lord. We've got partners. Who's interested in Zen? This is a partial list. Go to zenproject.org and look at the uh, look at the companies that uh, that we have there. These are just some of the biggies, and uh, you know, their names you know. It matters to these folks. If it matters to these folks, maybe we should be paying attention. Zen is also secure, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. And like I said, I've got an entire talk on this if, if people really want to get into it before I leave. But, you know, it uses SE Linux, but it's got another thing called Flask, which is a, the Zen security modules that are SE Linux compatible, made by the same people who did the SE Linux uh, work for Linux. And it allows a lot of that granularity to flow down to the individual VM level. Very powerful indeed. We've got a concept called disaggregation, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which allows you to, to wall off device drivers, basically, for both performance and security reasons. Um, and then it's a true type, type one hypervisor, and we'll discuss that in a minute, too. Because well, there's a lot of other hypervisors out there, but most of them are not really in the type one category. And uh, there's a the separate slide deck uh, most of the slides, by the way, from this talk and from other ones, this one isn't posted yet. If you go to zenproject.org, we've got an area that has presentations and videos. And just, uh, there's a ton of stuff there. So, I mean, if there's stuff that you don't get answered tonight or you, you find yourself thinking about later,
just pay it a visit. Uh, there's all sorts of talks and slide decks there that uh, are, are really uh, helpful. So Zen is configurable at scale. Uh, we'll talk in a minute about the tool stacks. We have multiple tool stacks uh, for the exact reason that different orchestrators want to do different things from different points of view. And Zen isn't trying to control what they do either. We're trying to give them the tools they need to get the job done. It is not GUI-centric, because anytime you're doing a thousand of anything, the last thing you want is to be pointing, pointing and clicking a thousand times. That doesn't mean that it can't accept a GUI. That's part of what Zen Orchestra Project is trying to do, and what all the cloud orchestrators are doing. But we're leaving that to, uh, you know, to, to people who want to achieve that. And it empowers through various power tools. How many people use Chef and Puppet and all that sort of stuff? Works very well uh, with Zen as well. So let's look at the tool stacks just for a second. We've got the hypervisor, and we see that there are three entirely different tool stacks. Uh, there's a default one. There is Libvirt, and if you work with KVM, you recognize Libvirt. And then there's a thing called Zappy that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute. But basically, uh, Zen had its own tool stack originally called XE, and now it's got sort of a hyped up version called XL, which is, uh, which is the default. But if you're doing stuff with KVM as well, you might want to be using Libvirt for everything. So we give you that possibility too. So if you want a mixed cloud of Zen and KVM, you can do it, because we give you that interface. And then there's Zappy. Zappy is our own cloudy tool set. XL looks at an individual host layer. Libvirt gives a little bit broader layer. And then Zappy gives you a whole cloud layer to work with. And if you ever work with the Zen server product or project, they tend to use Zappy for that sort of stuff. So once again, uh, it gives you additional functionality as you go, but it allows you to decide what you want and what you need, and then you can pick the toolkit. Now, you notice that there's different companies that have orchestrated solutions based on the different toolkits. So, I mean, uh, you know, Zen Server, as I said, tends to use Zappy. Uh, Oracle tends to use Excel. Uh, Hawaii, uh, which I never seen. Huawei. Huawei, Huawei yeah, yeah, Chinese yeah. company. <laughs> uh, does does Libvirt, and there's a bunch of others as well. And then you see Amazon uses uses Excel or XM. Um, you know, SUSE and Rackspace, and and so forth. You know, so I mean, different people have different views of the cloud. You know, one of the great things about open source, and I've been dealing with it for a long time, is that true open source doesn't try to block your mind. It tries to enable your mind so you can think different thoughts. And anytime you see something that comes along that says, you will think of it this way and this way alone, you've got a problem. And particularly in the cloud, the cloud is raw. I mean, I've been working with the cloud since 2004. And every year there's a new concept and a new turn and a new concept and idea, a new enhancement to the cloud concept. You don't want someone dictating a view of the cloud of what it looked like in 2006. You want to move with it. That's part of the theory behind the way uh, Zen is looking at this. He wants to give you the maximum amount of flexibility so as your cloud concept matures and changes, we're there for you. And we'll make it work for you. Was there a question? Or was that just a... Yeah. So I'm going to go back to the <coughs> point about the mix, a mix cloud, right? So you have, um, you know, the hypervisor here uh, coexisting with, let's say, Azure B or other types of hypervisor. Does your orchestration manager orchestrate the cloud uh, context be able to actually allow these different uh, hypervisors to work together to manage your workload? Well, part of it, now Hyper-V is a slightly different. Could you repeat the question? Oh, okay, for, for, for people who may not have heard it. Yeah. 
um, tool. The, you know, we've got these various toolkits, and we have different hypervisors, and can organization <coughs> layers use these so that all these various hypervisors can be used in concert inside a cloud structure to manage, to, to manage workload across. And so that's part of what we've started with the, with the whole Libvirt thing with KVM, because that's KVM's uh, ball field. Hyper-V is kind of a thing unto itself. Um, but once again, we're trying as best we can to give you the maximum flexibility. So I don't know where we're sitting, frankly, with the Hyper-V coexistence. We are not in a mindset to make it difficult to do that. Uh, we're trying to enable when we can. I don't know specifically about Hyper-V. But, uh, but part of what we're doing with this is to try to make it as wide and as broad and as useful as we can. And we're not hiding anything either. I mean, you know, there is a very well-known proprietary virtualization technology that uh, has its own version of not only the hypervisor, but has its own version of the cloud. And if you buy into their vision, great. But if your vision of what a cloud needs to be for your folks is different, uh, it gets a little antsy sometimes. We, we don't want that for for then you. Okay, could I be a bit more specific? Suppose, so if we take Hyper-V to be a little artful or whatever, but suppose I take, uh, you know, the same hypervisor, mm -hmm. VMware. How would the same orchestration manager work between the two hypervisors to shift the workload from the Well, Zen itself doesn't have the orchestration layer. We're enabling for the orchestration layer. So your orchestration layer may be OpenStack. Your orchestration layer may be CloudStack. We have a thing, there's a, there's a project called Zen Zen Orchestra, which is not part of Zen, it's another, it's actually a separate project that sort of works with Zen. And that's kind of focused on Zen itself, because that's just what they want to do. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to make ourselves available to all the orchestration layers that are out there. So if they want to play, we want to play, bottom line. Um, and we, we have been working with the OpenStack people, of course the CloudStack people have worked with us for quite a bit. And, uh, and anything else is game. You know, we don't want to force you into the orchestration layer that you don't want to have. Um, how, how many people are, just for my own knowledge, how many people are trying to work or are working with OpenStack right now? Like a show of hands? How many people are dealing with CloudStack? You know, it's interesting for me as I watch that because I'm not really involved with either of them, but I know people working with both. OpenStack to me is like, you know, it seems like the ultimate in the, in the number of possibilities. It's like if it was a shoe store, it would give you a catalog that's 100 pages thick with every <laughs> style, size, color combination you could imagine. Uh -huh. You order it, you get a box, you open the box, and here's a piece of rubber for the sole, and here's the tops for the, for the, for the shoes, and here's some uh -huh. lights, and it gives you instructions on how to cut and how to sew I and see. to come out with the shoe of your choice. Mm -hmm. And yes, a cobbler may be necessary to put them together. But CloudStack is more like, well, here's the, it has a lot fewer choices, but you order it, the box shows up, you put the laces on, and you start running. Mm -hmm. It's an entirely different concept with what you want to do. OpenStack does wonderful things in like so many ways, but you have to put it together most, most of the time. CloudStack dealing with an entirely different concept. It's something that you do a little configuration, it just sort of does what it does. But the big thing is it's up to you. Your hypervisor shouldn't be telling you what your orchestration layer should be doing. Your hypervisor should be there for the orchestration layer. Because you know what? The orchestration layer in two years is going to look radically different than it does today. It just is. Uh, it actually, you know, I think it's all about the granularity. If you look at, you know, back to my, back to my uh, order scaling question, you can, theoretically, you can order scale, do scaling at a process level, at an OS level, at a hypervisor level like Shin, or at a 
OpenStack. I, I, I think OpenStack is just a, another kind of operating system running on infrastructure as a service. And we also have OpenShift. I don't know, I don't know which kind of uh, relevant product uh, or uh, open source project from Cyclops, similar to Red Hat's OpenShift, right? I mean, uh, on past platform, you can also do auto scaling much easier, like what Google App is doing at that level. So there are vertically, there are uh, quite a few uh, granular things from processor, OS, hypervisor, I mean, OpenStack, and here OpenShift. I mean, so that you can. My question is uh, what do you think about uh, at which level? It is much more easier to do all of game, accomplish all of game task. At one level. Yeah. Oh, of course, it's an open question. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, uh, when it comes to auto scaling. Yeah. I mean, Cassad had an orchestrator that used to that used to be built directly around the concept of auto scaling. That as the need grew, the number of systems would grow. Scale up, or yeah. And as the need dwindled. The number of systems would dwindle. Yes. So it, it is, a, as far as I'm concerned, it is somehow a function of the cloud orchestrator. But where in the cloud orchestrator, I think it's, I, you know, I, I think it depends on the theory of the cloud. Because when you look at it, like I said, the cloud stack theory of the cloud is different from the open stack theory. And then there are other ones that deal with things differently. Again, the facade theory is entirely different. Let's assume public cloud, like an AWS or Rex based cloud server. For example, I just give you a very brief, uh, I mean, sample use case. You know, if your application is B2B, which is mission critical, you don't want to have those kind of uh, scale out, scale in every hour or every day because you want your cluster running full speed all the time. Right. But if your business like Amazon, I mean, at night probably you have less order, you know, during daytime or holiday season, they're totally different kind of, so they need a scale up and a scale, scale in and a scale out frequently. And I think believe most businesses, just like AWS, I mean, Amazon's business, that's a very simple use case. Well, I, I think the bottom line there, um, and because the, the SOT model, i go back to that, we actually had multiple models to handle that. Because there are some times when you want it to be Back. Like it's Christmas time, you want yeah. the web servers to be up yeah. regardless. <coughs> so you just want like, it to be just big. like Macy, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You you want it big, and then <laughs> you want it to have flexibility. There are other times when you just want it to respond. So it may start small, and then as things happen, things happen wildly. Which model is is uh, or which implementation is best for that? I I have no idea yet. Will Amazon make it? Will be Verizon? Verizon's doing something entirely different, using the same thing. The bottom line for Zen is that we want to make it possible for for all these various things uh, to occur. I mean, Zen worked with Cassad as well uh, back when that was still uh, viable. You know, so we're just trying to make it possible so that the next great idea is enabled. Bottom line. So uh, here's the Zappy layer, we'll just talk about that for a little bit more. It has the whole notion of a VM lifestyle. So this is one of the things where it becomes cloud functionality in a box almost. Uh, so you can, you can move snap snapshots around, you can checkpoint, uh, you can do migration, you can do storage uh, migration with ZenMotion. And uh, you know, it's got all these resource tools and, and so forth. Basically, all the building blocks of a cloud concept are right there. So you don't have to write your own. You can use Zappy with whatever orchestration layer you want to get the job done. Um, it's actually very powerful. And uh, uh, open, open vSwitch is in there. Uh, if you, if you want to know more, there's a link down there, too, that, uh, that has all sorts of details. I don't want to go into great detail here. Yes? Well, do you need to support VXLAN? Or do you do the uh, VM migration? Or, v, or VMotion? I, I didn't quite hear the question. Do you have the functionality of VXLAN? VXLAN? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Because you mentioned that you support the VMotion. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, 
there is there is a uh, within Zappy itself. I think using some of the Open V switch support and some of the other things that, that go no, with that. Hmm? Right. 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 But but I'm saying that that there's. I think there's some stuff built on that, but honestly, I can't. I, I don't know the detail of that. Uh, I haven't worked in that area too much when it comes to that, so I'm sorry. Uh, if you want, uh, uh, grab me afterwards. Let me see if I can get an answer for you. Okay. Uh, another big one is multi-tenancy, especially if you're a service provider. You want to be able to separate apples and oranges. You want everyone to have uh, have machines that look like they're in their own little world and not bumping up against the next guy's machine. Because you don't want your HR system to be visible to the guy who's running payroll for another organization. You want it to be invisible. You want the multi-tenancy to occur so that you can share resources and yet not compromise resources. So uh, Zappy uh, works very well in this area, and it's that's part of the reason why a lot of hosting providers actually like working with the Zappy layer. We're trying to stay, as I said before, we're trying to keep away from the lock. -in. We want you, especially if you're working on on your on your new cloud concept. You know, there are a lot of startups out there that want to do interesting things with with clouds, and there's other ones, you know, for like uh, Open Nebula and so forth. We want to be able to be there and provide the functionality they need. Period. That's the concept for us. And we are open source, so there's nothing held back. And if you want to join in, if there's something that we're not doing that you want us to do, join in. You know, that's part of the power of open source. And there is no corporate business plan either in the project or in what I'm doing up here, quite honestly. Uh, one of the things I have to say, I've been working with Citrix since the beginning of the year. I have had absolutely nothing, and I mean nothing, that says to push people towards anything that Citrix does. And that, to me, I mean, that's a lot of integrity. My boss is the same way. We're, uh, there's a number of us that are paid just to work with the open source world. There's a few others that are working, working with cloud stack same thing. That's a, it's a really great thing. So, you know, there is no corporate business plan. Uh, we talked a little bit about some of the orchestration layers. There's some of them right there. <coughs> uh, you know, Apache CloudStack, OpenStack, Open Nebula, Zen Orchestra. Uh, there are more. We want to be there. Bottom line. A quick question, yes, because sir. the title is talking about service-oriented architecture, but you haven't mentioned even one about service-oriented architecture. Why? Well, uh, actually, I have to uh, explain it. That is the topic title. I said, typically, I have always you know, said the topic for our speaker. But actually, that's different to what uh, uh, Russo, uh, but you may talk about, uh, about a little bit if you want. Uh, about the SOA, you know, the source Yeah, <laughs> because that's a big title there. Yeah, so, that's sorry, why I wonder. That, that's my mistake. Yeah, <laughs> all right, okay, yeah. Um, Again, a slightly different, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, just a quick thing on the, the project health check. Um, as, as I said before, we're part of the Linux Foundation. This is serious open source, it's not going away. Uh, within the Zen project itself, and by the way, zenproject.org, if you haven't been there, pay the visit. Uh, tons of information there, lots of useful stuff, including all sorts of presentations and so forth, and of course, all the technical stuff you want. But part of the Zen project, we have the hypervisor, of course, which is what we can talk about. There's the Zappy layer, which is its own project as part of it. There's the ARM hypervisor, and we'll talk about this in, uh, shortly. How many people are, are looking at ARM servers for the future? Anyone? It's actually a really, really neat area uh, because there's a lot of interesting things going on there, and we're we're already yeah mobile yeah that mobile space. mobile mobile yeah mobile mobile very yeah and yeah then, very hot next wave yeah for mobile and then the Mirage OS which we'll talk about in just a second too which is actually incredibly cool as far as the project governance goes it's sort of a mixture between 
the way the Linux kernel operates and the way Apache operates. Um, very consensus driven. Uh, we do have our own incubator and Mirage OS is like one of the ones inside the incubator and uh, a PMC style uh, structure. Contributions from the community. Uh, this is kind of a slightly old slide. We don't have all the 2013 numbers in here. But as you see, initially it was a few large contributors just three years ago. But then as you look across, you end up with more and more major contributors now coming in and doing significant work, which has been one of the great things about, about uh, the Zen community, is that it is now growing um, markedly. And we're finding that companies that two years ago weren't weren't dealing with Zen at all, are now becoming major uh, contributors. Samsung has, has been a big one recently, um, coming along and doing things. So we're still, you know, it's not that this is the old hypervisor and we're just keeping it going. New feature development is rolling along hard and fast. Um, there are more features. Uh, we mentioned Zen Motion. There's also high availability in Remus. Uh, which is one of the things that you have to enable separately, but it's uh, once again very interesting. That's part of zapping. Um, we we uh, work with a number of different control domains in a second. I'll try to be a little bit more specific about that. Guest domains, you know, uh, I mean, what sort of VMs? You know, it can be Windows, it can be uh, it can be Linux, it can be any number of the BSDs. Uh, we've enabled a lot of them. And then uh, virtualization modes, which we'll talk about in a second. And once again, this will give you better choice. Let me try to deal with architecture here for just a second when it comes to the hypervisor. This is, this is a, a diagram of a type one hypervisor. How many people have seen a diagram for a type one hypervisor before? Okay, good. So this is kind of a typical uh, type one hypervisor. Um, we see that we've got host hardware, most hardware down the bottom. We've got a hypervisor layer, and it's got the schedule of the MMU. It's got device drivers. And then you've got the VMs that sit on top. So that's kind of a, you know, a fairly textbook picture. Zen, or excuse me, here's a, here's a type two hypervisor, which is a, a slightly uh, a different one. Uh, KVM comes a little closer to this model, although they're a little bit different in their own. And we see that we've got the host layer, but now we've got a host OS with the device driver, 